The epistle for today's Feast of Pentecost is taken from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. When the days of Pentecost were accomplished, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty wind coming, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them parted tongues as it were of fire, and it sat upon every one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they began to speak with diverse tongues according as the Holy Ghost gave them to speak. Now there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men of every nation under heaven. And when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded in mind because that every man heard them speak in his own tongue. And they were all amazed and wondered, saying, Behold, are not all these that speak Galileans? And how have we heard every man our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and inhabitants of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya around Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews also, and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We have heard them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. Please stand for the gospel. The gospel is taken from the 14th chapter of the gospel of St. John. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone love me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him, and will make our abode with him. He that loves me not keeps not my words. <clears throat> and the word which you have heard is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things have I spoken to you, abiding with you. But the paraclete, the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, and bring all things to your mind whatsoever I shall have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives do I give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, nor let it be afraid. You have heard that I said to you, I go away, and I come unto you. If you loved me, you would indeed be glad, because I go to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it shall come to pass, you may believe. I will not now speak many things with you, for the prince of this world comes, and in me he has not anything. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father has given me commandment, so do I. Please be seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Dear Reverend Father, dear faithful, some sermons are full of exhortation while other sermons are full of instruction. The sermons that are full of exhortation are directed towards the hearts of the hearers and are meant to get them to do something, whereas the sermons of instruction are directed towards their minds and are more directed to get them to understand something than to get them to do something. And, well, this sermon is going to be one of those instruction sermons, a more catechetical sermon. On this birthday of the Catholic Church, I want to teach you something about the church. But Father, you're saying, well, pretty much all of your sermons are like that. Um, well, that's kind of true. But this sermon is really going to be more like that even than normal. The instruction of this sermon comes in the form of a story. And the story starts with God before the universe was created, when the only thing that existed was God, the Holy Trinity. And we want, we want to ask ourselves, when we consider God, the Holy Trinity, existing by himself without anything else existing, is this. What were the rights of God and what were the duties of God as he existed before the world came into being? When we consider his rights, which are the same as privileges, rights are privileges. When you have a right, you have a privilege to do something. When we ask about God's rights, and we think about there he is, you know, existing, an infinite being. No one else exists. Nothing else exists. We have to say he has supreme rights, total rights, complete rights, infinite rights whatever rights we may think about, life, liberty, happiness, whatever rights, he has them all. What about God's duties? Were there any obligations resting on the shoulders of God where he had to do something, where 
he was beholden to somebody and must accomplish certain things. Was God obliged to create the angels? Was God obliged to create the universe? Is God obliged to create human beings? Is there anything that he has to do in justice? And the answer is no. No. There's no obligation on the part of God to create anything whatsoever. And that's the first thing that we have to understand about our God. He has supreme rights, and he has no duties. All rights and no duties. That's, in fact, what it means to be a supreme being. There's nothing that God is obligated to do for the simple reason that there's no one above God to oblige him. There's no one above him to say, well, because I did this for you, or because I'm above you, I get to impose obligations upon you. There's nothing like that for God. He has no duties. All rights, no duties. That's what it means to be a supreme being. In God, rights come before duties. So let us now come to the second part of our story, where God, the supreme possessor of rights, is the only thing existing. He has no duty to create anything. And so there's no obligation in justice resting upon his shoulders. But he does decide to create things. And if it's not out of obligation, if there's no duty in justice, then if God creates, it must not be because of duty. It must be out of love. When you do things out of justice, it's because you are obliged to do so. There is something resting upon you, some obligation resting upon you. Well, that is not why God creates. God creates simply because he's good and he wishes to communicate his goodness. He's not fulfilling any mandate placed upon him, but it's just an overflow of his goodness that out of the boundless love of his infinite existence, he brings us and the rest of the universe into existence. Okay. So he creates the universe, he creates the angels, he creates the human beings, he creates the animals, he creates the plants, he creates all the things that exist beside himself. And now there are other beings around. Creatures. What about them? What about their rights? What about their duties? What can we say about their duties and rights as compared to God? We said that God had all rights and no duties. What about creatures? In creatures, it's the opposite than it is with God. For creatures, duties come before rights. By the fact that a creature is brought into existence by another being, it is, by definition, beholden to that being. It has certain obligations to that being. Anyone who is a receiver has obligations to the giver. And when it comes to human beings, we are receivers from God to an extreme degree. I mean, it's one thing when you receive a box of chocolates or you receive a new car or we receive some sort of gift, a sign of affection from somebody. But it's quite another thing when you receive existence itself. There is no way to be in a greater sense of dependence upon anybody than if you receive existence itself from that being. Because you, you can't receive anything unless you exist. You gotta first exist, right? So ultimately, uh, whatever, whoever you get existence from is bestowing upon you the ultimate basis of you being a receiver at all. So. We creatures do not start off, as a result, we creatures do not start off as right-bearing, eternally existing entities. We all start off as nothing, absolutely and utterly nothing, non-existing stuff. If it's just you can't even use words to speak about this. We, are, we were nothing at one time. Then an all-loving creature, uh, sorry, an all-living creator, not a creature, brings us into existence. And from that first moment, we 
because we received existence from him, are bound to follow the existence that he's given us. We're, he creates human beings in a certain way, and we have a duty to live according to the laws of human nature. And that's just the way things are for all creatures. God establishes the fact and reality. He establishes all facts and reality. He makes them to be a certain way. Those who are established in reality have a duty to follow what he's established because he's the creator. They're not the creator. They have the duty to follow what he's established. You're like, well, what about my rights, Father? When are you going to speak about my rights? That's all we talk about today is rights, human rights. And unfortunately, we have this idea that we can somehow manufacture rights, that we can recreate rights. But what I'm trying to explain is that rights do not exist except in relation to God. Any right that we may claim has to be traced ultimately to what God has established. Because we are not those eternally existing things that can just create realities and make reality to be whatever we want. We can only take reality as it is, as it's been established by the supreme creator, the supreme possessor of rights. We have to take that fact, then acknowledge what duties flow from that, and then, only then, can we talk about rights. You and I, we have a right to do what God has established. We have a right to follow, for instance, the laws of our human nature. God has created us to breathe, so we have a right to breathe. God has created us to, to speak, given us the power to speak, so we have a right to, to speak. God has given, created us for, for things like marriage or human society, so we have a right to, to marry, to, to have human society. Our rights flow from our duties, which flow from what God has created. That is the way it works for human beings. That is the way it works for all creatures. We have a right to do what God has made us to do, as long as those things are directed to, to the purpose for which God has created us. And we don't have a right for anything else. There is no other right. So if, if we want to do anything that steps outside of what God has established, our rights cease. That is why we argue that something like same-sex marriage is, is not a right at all, can never be a right, or abortion. Abortion can never be a right, because God did not establish in human beings, the, as part of their human nature, the right to kill their own children. It doesn't exist. Humans can't make it exist. We can't create rights because we can't create reality. The rights flow from what existed, which flows from God, our creator. Okay. Father, you're saying to yourself, I think you've chosen the wrong subject for Pentecost Sunday. Do you, did you realize that it is Pentecost Sunday? Um, maybe this is a Trinity Sunday sermon next week, but it doesn't seem to be a Pentecost Sunday sermon. Um, okay. Just hang in there. Stay with me. I want to use what I've spoken about, about the nature of rights and the fact that they ultimately must come from God or they do not exist at all, and apply it to the rights of Holy Mother, the Church. Because what applies in the natural order also applies in the supernatural order. Just as God is in control of the natural order and rights in the natural order only flow from what God has established, so too in the supernatural order we only have a right to do what God has established. So when we come to religion, the same principle holds true. We have rights only in relation to our duties, and our duties come from what God has established. Well, what has God established with regards to religion? What has God done? Has God done anything with regards to religion from which we can evaluate what are the rights of human beings? What has God done in the realm of religion? Well, again, out of the superabundance of the goodness of God, he decided to assume a human nature, to take on our own humanity. He became incarnate as a man, 
and he did not want to marry any human woman. But he, he chose to become wedded to the church that he founded. Our Lord married one bride, a spotless bride, the Catholic Church, which he instituted for the salvation of all mankind. And remember, this is the same God who is above all, who has eternally existed. He becomes incarnate in time. That same God who controls reality, who has the whole universe between his thumb and his index finger, becomes incarnate and establishes a church, a religion, the Catholic faith, the Catholic Church. As a result, because this is the one religion that was established by God, it is the only religion that has rights in the supernatural order. It alone has the right to exist among all religions. It alone is the religion to which human beings have a right to, to, to enter and to worship because it is the only religion that was established by God. And, I mean, if we, if we deny this, what we end up doing is ultimately denying that God is the ultimate bearer of rights. If we deny it, we end up saying that no, human beings do have the power to create rights. They have the power to create rights in the natural order. They have power to create rights in the supernatural order. No, human beings can create religions. They can create belief systems. They have a right to establish the way they want to worship. Well, first of all, what they want to worship, they can worship whatever they want, and they can worship that thing however they want. If we make this claim, as unfortunately so many people do today, unfortunately so many in the Catholic Church, so many hierarchs in the Catholic Church would make this claim that humans have a right to worship whatever they want to worship and worship however they want to worship. If they do that, if they make this claim, then essentially they are saying God is not the supreme possessor of rights, that human beings have a godlike power, that somehow, yes, we can define rights and privileges, and it's not up to God. So please understand that when I say this, when I say there's, there's really no objective right for a Buddhist to be a Buddhist, there's no objective right for the Baptist to be a Baptist, there's no objective right for the Muslim religion to exist because those religions cannot trace back to God and say, well, God established what I am doing, therefore I have a right to do it. Unless you can do that, there is no real right in objective reality. But I am just speaking about objective rights. I'm not speaking about the subjective dispositions of people. And we, of course, we have to take those into account. Subjectively speaking, many people are very confused about religion. They don't understand the rights of the Catholic Church. And in those cases, of course, we have to be tolerant of their state of ignorance. I'm preaching this sermon for you as Catholics, so you understand the rights of the Church. I'm not telling you that you go out there and force people to convert. That would be totally wrong. We have to tolerate the ignorance of people and gently lead them into the one church founded by our Lord Jesus Christ, who is God. That's what we have to do. But we don't force them to convert. You can't force people to convert. It's impossible. You force bodies to do things. Bodies can be forced to do things. But hearts and minds and wills cannot be forced by their very nature. They're spiritual things. They cannot be forced. So jihad is not Catholic. This is, this is not part of the, the Catholic faith. That's why the church has never condoned forcing people to be Catholic, even though Catholicism is the only relig religion that has a right to exist. What I want to make clear for you is precisely that fact, so that you be tolerant of, of others in their false religions, but without ever denying the rights of the church. So my dear faithful, on this birthday of Holy Mother Church, let us be very, very clear about this. There is only one God. He is the supreme possessor of rights. If any creatures have rights, it's because of what he established. Any rights that any creature has must be traced back to the supreme possessor of rights and what he has established 
in reality. So he created human beings. He came on this earth. He created the Catholic Church. He even wedded himself to that church. He endowed his bride, the church, with special rights, the right to instruct the nations, the right to exist, the right to guide all souls to heaven. And though we will often be in a position where we will have to tolerate false religions, family members who, who are in the, in the wrong faith or family members who have fallen away from the faith, we must never hold that these people have a right to do what they're doing. Because this is against the faith. It's against the Catholic teaching. It's against the rights of our Lord Jesus Christ and our Holy Mother of the Church. So on this Pentecost Sunday, 2020, let us remember that the Catholic faith is the one true faith. That the church alone can get us into heaven because she alone has those God-given rights. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.